Do you like sports? Do you like art? What about science? Giraffes? Giraffe scientists that paint rugby games? It's all available on Audible, the biggest audiobook site with the largest selection of audiobooks this side of the inner solar system. No need to use your boring old eyes anymore. The ears are the future, my friend. Why, you're using them right now. So check out Audible and get your listen on. Go to www.readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to start your 30-day free trial today. I think that storytelling is as important as oxygen. It take away the stories from our lives and we die, just as if you take away the oxygen and we die. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster. As always, if you have ideas for books you'd like to see featured or of authors you want to put me in touch with, you can reach me at jon at readlearnlivepodcast.com. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with author Ilan Stavans about his book, Popol Vuh, A Retelling. Ilan Stavans is a Louis Sebring Professor of Humanities, Latin America and Latino Culture at Amherst College, and the publisher of Restless Books. He is a prolific translator, author, and public intellectual. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, his work, rendered into 20 languages, has been adapted to film, TV, radio, and theater. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Read, Learn, Live podcast. I'm your host, John Monaster. And I am very excited today to be speaking with Ilan Stavans, author of this retelling of Popol Vuh, as you'll hear about. Um, And it is, I saw this copy of it, the, not only is the text amazing, there are just gorgeous and beautiful illustrations. Uh, I really think it's such an interesting book. So, and it's very outside of a book that, that I might have just grabbed. So I'm glad to have gotten the opportunity to, uh, to read and to learn about it, and I'm excited to share it with all of you. So first off, uh, let me welcome Alan. Alan, thanks so much for joining me. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Very excited. Good, me too. Um, so just to kind of kick us off, just tell people what Popol Vuh is. You know, what, what, what is this story that you're telling? Popol Vuh is the most important pre-Columbian narrative about how the book, how the world was created. Um, It is uh, an astonishing piece of literature uh, because what we mostly have from the pre-Columbian cultures, and I'm talking about the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Olmecs, the the Incas, is uh, accounts that uh, were delivered to us in oral tradition and then disappeared. But one or two managed to survive And the Popol Vuh is the most enduring and the most distinguished of them. It was transcribed by a Dominican priest in the 18th, at the very beginning of the 18th century. We know that some of the folklore that the Quiche people, which were part of the Mayan civilization, had passed on from one generation to the next are somehow filtered into that narrative, although because it comes to us from a priest who transcribed them, uh, we have a, a kind of outsider that leads this story. But in essence, John, this is the way the indigenous population of Mexico and Northern Central America saw the world a their perspective, how the world was created, a, who were the gods, who were the demiurgs, who, how, when the animals were created. Um, it is kind of the Bible for them. Mm. It is still very much a crucial text. It is a sacred narrative. And to me, it feels just a, a sense of duty and of awe to be able to bring it to, to the, an English language audience. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's super helpful, and I think you you started to answer my question there about you know the the retelling of it, you know, in the sense of you know what about it makes it 
suitable for retelling. So maybe I'll just ask, you know, why did you feel personally like it was important to you to retell this? I, I, I really appreciate that question, um, John. I am a, a scholar of Hispanic culture and a scholar of American culture. Uh, I am also a translator, a, a writer, and a novelist. And uh, for the most part, uh, whenever I translate a text from a contemporary author or from an author from the past, I try to come as close as I can and be as loyal as possible to what I'm reading on the page and present it to the English language audience in, is, is in as genuine and authentic a fashion. On this occasion, however, I wanted to take a very different approach. Um, the text is somewhat uh, amorphous. Mm -hmm. There are beautiful sections of this narrative, the Popol Vuh, uh, just like you have in the Bible, you know, the book of Genesis is a beautiful book that tells you about how the world was created in seven days, the world that God had, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. And, and those chapters are uh, essential to the way the, the, the Western civilization has has shaped its, 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 its views. Um, but then in the Bible, as you go on, uh, in the book of Numbers, in the book of Exodus, uh, Deuteronomy, there are long sections of generations that come and go, names, and uh, the narrative becomes dry and uh, it lacks. Um, it is difficult to plow through it. The same thing happens with the Popol Vuh. Uh, some of the beautiful sections are exalted. They are really inspired and, and they are um, uh, very powerful. But then mm. there are others where you find out what this king did and how he had a child or three or two or three children and the successors. So I wanted to be able to reintroduce the Popol Vuh to a young and a, a, a diverse audience, giving them the story in its in its essence as loyally as 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 authentically as I could, but without necessarily being stumbled or distracted by those sections that I believe can be put aside or are exclusively for scholars. So my approach as a uh, on this occasion wasn't really to translate. Mm. word by word or section by section, but to activate my own imagination and to retell the story. And I felt that I could do it because as I was telling you before, this started as oral tradition. It was told from uh, grandmothers to granddaughters, uh, from, from one generation to the next. And I often feel that the written word has kind of interrupted that oral tradition and what you have on the page is fixed and nothing can be changed. But I think a reteller can reinvent some of the story and can be part of that oral tradition. So mm -hmm. I, was, I, I went to, to see what people had done with the Canterbury Tales, with the Nordic sagas like Neil Gaiman has done. And I felt that I could be empowered and justified in taking a more active role. So this is really why it is a retelling. It is very much the story in itself, but it is presented to the contemporary reader in a language that I think will be appealing and attractive. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really amazing and, and probably took a lot of really hard thought and work and trying to figure out, you know, how, how, to, how to accomplish that goal. And I definitely see that, you know, like I mentioned, there was there's all these beautiful illustrations. And so that was clearly one part of how to achieve that goal, how to make it more accessible is to include the illustration. So how did that process work? What was it like working with um, working with Gabriela, your illustrator? Yeah, Gabriela Larios is a, is a, a very important uh, artist from Central America, from uh, El Salvador. And um, when I decided that I would embark on this project, I reached out to her and asked her if she would be interested in illustrating it uh, in the spirit of the, the, the colors and the characters and the aesthetic 
of Central America, of El Salvador, and of the culture that she had grown up in. She was very, very um, uh, attracted to the idea. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a first draft and then sent it to her. And she and I worked very closely on uh, my producing subsequent drafts. This went through many, many drafts. Uh, as you were saying before, it had to do with um, uh, being very careful that uh, every single aspect of the story is there. And at the same time, allowing the story to have some space to, to grow. And then seeing the images that Gabriela was, was already creating in allowing those images to come back to me in, in, in the act of, of writing and being a, a kind of platform to imagine these characters visually. I'm very, very happy with how the, the book has, has, a, has, how it came out. It is lavishly and very handsomely illustrated. It is very truthful to, to the iconography of the, the Mayans and of the Quiche in particular. And at the same time, time it has a very modern sensibility that I think people will recognize. It is kind of the tapestries and the, and the uh, icons that people find in a lot of the folklore um, and artesanías of Latin America today. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I agree that I mean, there was just the illustrations were great, and you, I spent a lot of time just kind of gazing at them, you know, on their <laughs> works of art on their own. Um, so yeah, let's let's hop into the book a little bit and and start to share with people some of the some some of the content. Um, maybe just kick us off with uh, telling us a little bit about what the creation story was here. You know, it it's interesting just to think about how you know every culture seems to have their creation story. And, and, you know, to the extent that you're aware of, maybe talk about any similarities of this creation story to others or any major differences or, or anything that you thought really made it stand out. Yeah, I, I, I would um, start by suggesting that there's no people, there's no, no possibility of it being part of a people if there's no memory. And mm -hmm. that memory it does not become in some way a, a narrative that allows people to feel that they are part of a community. A, for a country like the United States to come together, we need to have certain books that tell us who we are, you know, the, the Constitution, a, the, the stories about a George Washington and Jefferson and the Founding Fathers, or the poetry of the 19th century. I would say, John, that um, at the heart of any people, there's a book. And maybe even that the book makes the people a people. Uh, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims all have books, you know, the, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, the Quran, that uh, make them who they are and they are sacred. Uh, what's the difference between a sacred book and a, and a regular book? Well, that the sacred book proposes that it is written by a single a omnipotent, omnipotent, omnipotent author, an mm -hmm. author that uh, sees everything and feels everything and monitors everything. Uh, that is the vision that we have in the Bible. Uh, and those, that's the vision that we have in the, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Christian Bible, uh, and in other books of origins. I, I think that even when you're in your own family, families create their own stories. Um, who we were, where our ancestors come from, how did Pa and Ma come together? What was the first house? What were the first memories that brought us uh, to be who we are? And the, the Popol Vuh is the story of how the Quiche believed that they had come as a people. The, the book starts, it's divided into various parts. In my retelling, it's divided into four parts. And there's a section that is, tells the story of how the world was created. Mm -hmm. when the gods decided that they were going to shape the world and how the world was, was, was shaped, the relationship between the animals. There is a beautiful image there that before the creation of humans and after the creation of animals, uh, which is roughly what you have in the Bible, there yeah. was another people in between that they were the wood people um, that were a kind of exercise or rehearsal for the gods to a plan on what the, the, 
the, the future humans would be. And, uh, and, and then from there, it goes to kind of the mythical figures who are supposed to be the equivalent of the founding fathers and the founding mothers of the Kiche, people of the Mayas. And after that, the formation of the, of the nation, who were mm -hmm. the first kings and monarchs and how they called people to war and how they fought the different tribes that existed in what was called then Mesoamerica, which is Mexico and the upper part of, of Central America, and the, the trials and tri tribulations that they went through. And it comes, in my own rendition, it comes to the very moment when the Spaniards arrived uh, in 1492 and in the 16th century, uh, and the, the struggle that the Quiche people will have to go through to survive, to have their own language intact, to have their own stories not forgotten now that the Spaniards uh, have, have made it to that region and they have colonized and they have oppressed the population and it pushes it to the very present um, as it tells the story uh, that, is, that continues from generation to generation. So the, 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 that is pretty much kind of the layout. The, the creation story is really beautiful uh, in the book. It is the story of a heart of light and heart of darkness, which is a kind of a God, God image, a, mm -hmm. an earthly image that, uh, that decides that uh, it is going to create the world. And the very, few, few, the very first few paragraphs are about this hesitation, should the world be created? How does the water look? How does the earth look? And then how things start to separate mountains and rivers and animals. Um, it's a very deliberate version, and it is also a version that could well have been very influenced by the reading of the Bible that the Spaniards had brought in in, mm. in 1492, and that probably kind of infiltrated or permeated that the, the indigenous population and marked the way they were seeing their own stories. Oh, huh, yeah. At, you know, one of the things I, I was thinking about as I was reading this book and, and it kind of struck me as you were talking about it is I feel like a lot of the foundational books you were talking about that these different societies, cultures have uh, often have certain seemingly certain values or certain lessons, mm -hmm. you know, that they try and pass down to try and keep newer members, you know, um, keep them honest to to the ways of old and how things should be, you know, maybe just talk a little bit about the, the extent to which there are these, you know, any kind of like life lessons or values or yeah. any of that within the, the stories that are being told. And maybe do you see any kind of consistent messages across them? Yeah. And, and I, I want to do that, John, by, by um, bringing in Star Wars here. <laughs> okay, Star great. Star Wars is... Uh, an origin story too. Yeah, it's a very popular story. Obviously, in in popular culture in the United States, but projects itself way beyond. It is a story of rebellion. It's a story of fathers and sons. You know, Dark Vader and Luke Skywalker is a story of monarchs and kings and different planets that rebel. The different castes or or, or classes of people. Mm -hmm. They of the. It, and in, in many ways, it has at the center this idea that we can really relate to many other cultures. There's a force. And Yoda says to look, to, to look at the very beginning of the, the, at least the first episode that was, that, that was released. Right. The force be with you. You won't see the force, but you will feel it. You will mm -hmm. sense it. And you will only become a Jedi when you are able to a, make that force part of you. And I think that that is something that is very much uh, a component of many of these origin stories. They might not have the force as a character or as an ingredient, but the act of telling the story itself is meant for new generations to feel a certain kind of palpitation of their heart, that this is mine, that this defines me, that it gives me my own identity, that I am my father's son or my, my mother's son, and that it is my responsibility to push this to the next generation when I have children. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is at the core 
of the Popol Vuh. It's the story of how the Quiche want to remain Quiche. They don't want to be confused with other cultures. They want to define themselves. And just as in the story of uh, Star Wars, where there's always a hero. Mm -hmm. goes through all sorts of trials and tribulations. You think at some point uh, Luke is going to be erased uh, and, you know, killed. In others, he can, um, you know, corral his own uh, generals and orchestrate a rebellion. Uh, you have that in the Popol Vuh. You have uh, a set of twins. Uh, the, the, one of the fascinating aspects of this book is that it's always made of doubles. Even mm -hmm. Heart of uh, Darkness, Heart of a, a Earth, a, it can be, it, it mutates, the name can mutate. It is always made of different halves that come together. It, mm -hmm. they, there are a number of twins in the book that really are always playing with each other. And if one is in, in, in difficulty, the other one comes in and rescues him and vice versa. And at the very end of the story, there's a set of twins that is, that is two girls that carry the story to the future. Um, I love that, that aspect of um, maybe the yin and yang. Thing. In order to have evil, you need to have good. And in order to have good, you need to have evil, light and darkness, warmth and cold. Um, and the whole book is built through this kind of a, a dynamic or dialectic, dialectic of two parts. But at the heart of it, John, is the fact that there will be a hero, or in this case, a set of two heroes that will, uh, they will not survive. I don't want to tell too much of the story, but they will not right. survive. Uh, they, their legacy will live on in the next generation. And even the next generation will suffer terribly before the Kichet people come to see themselves, kind of see their own image and reflect and, and realize what their capacity to survive is or isn't. It's a story of origins, but as I was saying, it's a story of survival. And uh, when one talks of indigenous cultures of Latin America, survival is a, such an important aspect because those cultures, there were 6,000 languages when the Spaniards arrived in, in 1492. And today there are just a few dozen. A lot of the tribes have been decimated. Um, and every time a member of another indigenous tribe in Latin America dies, the last one of her or his tribe, an entire culture dies with, with her or with him. Yeah. Yeah, no, those, those are all good points. And yeah, I definitely recognize that that duality that was present in so many different ways within the book. Um, you know, one of the things that I think was was one of the core parts when you were talking about that, um, the light and darkness and the twins, there were all these sort of trials that our heroes, the twins, had to go through, right? And so they were kind of the good, and they had to go to um, this place, Shab Shababa, mm -hmm. and, and just complete all these trials and go against you know, all these lords. And so I think that that was really fascinating to me as sort of like, um, this, this kind of, that, that was almost like the epic battle for light and darkness. If you compare it to the star Wars, like of, of this book, you know, it's like, who, who's going to win, who's going to out yeah. with the other, who, yeah. who's stronger, who's smarter and all that. So I was just fascinated by the, the beautiful descriptions of Shababa and the characters and, and what they did. And, and I also think that, I mean, a lot of it wasn't just brute strength it was also about being smarter and, and, and outwitting them and i thought that that was interesting too so, so maybe talk about that part of the book and what it sure. is and how the twins dealt with all these trials and, and and what happened there yeah um you know we are um as a contemporary civilization really filled with images of hell and purgatory um, and depending on how religious someone might be you people think that in the afterlife you're going to end up in this atrocious place where there's fire and where the souls burn in perpetuity for sins that they have committed and in in the history of painting or in the history of literature there are all these very vivid depictions 
of hell and purgatory, and also in contrast with heaven, what, how does heaven look? What, who is there? Who is waiting for us? Is it, is it going to be a more interesting place than hell? I, for one, always think that hell is where the fun people have gone, and <laughs> heaven is just the boring people, the ones that just follow all the rules. Yeah. And, and the, you have various authors, for instance, in, I'm thinking of Dante, who wrote the Divine Comedy, who really uh, imagined a, the journey of the soul. In, in this case, he was uh, the soul that mm -hmm. was underneath to hell, and then he travels to purgatory, only to be able to ascend one day and find his beloved Beatrice in, in heaven. And very few people know, because the Popol Vuh is not as well known as the Divine Comedy or certain books of the Bible, that the uh, Kiche people of the, that were a portion of the Mayas had an incredible and very complex view of what the underworld was exactly under us. There were, in their view, caves in Belize, in Guatemala, in southern Mexico, where you could descend and you would have to face the atrocious and very frightening lords of Shibaba who were there in order to challenge you, to pose all sorts of obstacles. And they, the Quiche the, the, the imagined the architecture of this place. That there were rivers in Shibalba, and there were mountains, and there were sections that were controlled by bats, and others that were controlled by uh, ferocious dogs. And um, it, one of the great aspects of doing this project is that I was able to bring into English, into the English language, the, the beauty of the description of that Shibalba, and to do something more. You know, we, we today, John, are very, very connected and maybe obsessed with sports. Mm. We, you know, yeah. soccer, baseball, football, basketball, uh, people see it as an entertainment, but there's an aspect of sports that is also very religious uh, and maybe also even like a, an aspect of legend and of folklore. There is always a battle between two sides one has to win, it's about intelligence, it's about strategy, it's about being dexterous. <clears throat> and, in the, and for the Mayan people, sports were very important. Mm -hmm. Play ball, uh, they play a, a variety of ball that is kind of a mixture between volleyball, but mostly s soccer, although they played it with their knees, not with their feet, and they had to put the ball that was made of rubber in between a, a, a circle that was vertical and put in a pyramid or, or, or engraved in a stone. And, they, and not only did the Quiche people love the, the football, you know, this game of sport, but yeah. the lords of Shibaba are great players too. And when the two twins have to uh, go through all these obstacles, the lords of Shibaba want mostly to see how good or bad uh, athletes they are. And they mm. push them all sorts of uh, challenges and they have animals that will detract them from doing what they should be doing in order to win the game or vice versa. Um, the, it, there is another aspect that I would love to mention here. In Latin yeah. America, John, we have something called magical realism. That is, the, that many writers use magic in their writing, like A Hundred Years of Solitude, in order to tell their stories. And a lot of that magic comes from the Popol Vuh. A lot of things that are illogical happen in this book. For instance, in one of these uh, uh, games, one of the twins loses his hand. And just in the next scene, his hand is back in the right place. Or one of them is decapitated. And two scenes later, the head is back in the right place. In, in, in realistic literature, we never have that. You die, you die. It's like in the, in the real world. But in this kind of sometimes childish, sometimes a legend-driven universe, all sorts of things can happen that are that go against logic, and that happens to the twins and happens to other characters as well. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. I'm actually a huge fan of kind of that genre of magical realism. Uh, and I've kind of, I think it's been picked up. It's interesting to think about its potential origins, even from the Popol Vuh, because I've read authors from around the world that kind of use that idea of, you know, where there's reality, but there's a little something more to it and we can play with it and tweak it a little bit, but we don't need to go full on to, you know, fantasy or Star Wars or something. So that, that slight little extra bit i think is is fascinating yeah um and, and if i can if i can just continue yeah. on this there is you know there's another difference john between those uh, sacred texts that we were talking about the the the, the narratives about origins and mm -hmm. contemporary novels in that contemporary novels and short stories enable us to get inside the head of a character so yeah whatever the, the protagonist is going through the, the, the narrator or the author would say, and she thought this, or she wasn't sure about that. And she was, she was deciding if she was gonna marry him or not marry him, or she was going to do this or that. Um, but in, in the Bible, in the Quran, and in books like the Popol Vuh, you are never invited to go into the head of the characters. The characters hmm. are what they say. And so the Lords of Shibaba will say, no, you are not going to be able to do this. We're going to send you to this particular dark chamber where you're going to uh, pay for all your sins. And, and that we don't hear, well, but I have, I'm, I'm having doubts. Maybe I shouldn't send them there. Or we don't hear hmm. what the original, uh, what the characters go through. And so it's a very, in many ways, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an old fashioned type of telling a story. But I think it has such beautiful language and such connections with magical realism that it gives you a sense of tradition of yeah. the whole region. And uh, one appreciates it even more when one knows all those other aspects that have been written after that. Yeah, that's a great point. Something I actually hadn't thought about till now. But yeah, it'd be really interesting just to think of it in that term and kind of look at the evolution of the way that we tell stories um, over time. Mm -hmm. So I, I also want to be sure and talk about, um, sunrise, you know, that part of the book when, you know, we really start to get to humanity now. And, uh, that part was also just fascinating because, you know, well, I guess we, we could talk about a lot, but the first, I mean, the first four humans, these were, they were all male yeah. and, you know, they were granted this incredible gift of life. And over the course of the book, it turns out maybe they're not the greatest people <laughs> and uh so d just kind of like that's an interest to me that's a very interesting way of talking about you know who could be almost deified in some way yeah and, and maybe some alternate version of this so i guess i was just curious you know why do you think that happened and, and to what you know do you have a sense of how men, what the role of men were in the quiche society the 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 really a um, mind-blowing aspect of the Popol Vuh is that unlike other stories of origin in other cultures, in other, with other people, here the gods that create the humans seem not to decide to create them from scratch at the very beginning, kind of the humans are going to be at the center of the universe and the whole world is going to rotate around those humans that is the vision that you have in genesis 1 and genesis 2 you know there, there's there's the creation of the animals there's the creation of nature of a of a flora and fauna mm -hmm. but it is really at the moment where adam is created and then from one of his ribs that eve comes about that you have the sense that the garden of Eden has now come to what its original intention was. But mm -hmm. the Popol Vuh, you have the sense that the, that the creators, and it is not a book about one God, but about a series of gods that are always debating. And one of them looks like a bird, it's like a, like a peacock, and the other ones are connected with water. They are debating and sometimes even fighting with one another. And they are rehearsing possibilities of creation they want to create creatures that will bow to them and celebrate them and have them as almighty entities. 
Uh, so they created the animals and they realized that the animals don't have any intelligence or the type of intelligence that they wanted. They create the wood people that are mm -hmm. also without the capacity to think and process. And only after they have rehearsed this, these various versions, they come to humans thinking that the humans are going to be the best third option, not the first option. So it is not a, 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 an anthropocentric vision of the world, the way we have mm -hmm. the cultures. And I think in that sense, it's a very ecological and much more balanced book. It is about how the gods have created nature for nature's sake. And there are good things in nature and bad things of nature. And I have the impression that this book really speaks to contemporary views of how we humans have usurped, have taken over the world and, and are in the process of destroying it. And the book suggests to us that we are not kings and queens, that we are just one more aspect of that creation and that we have to be mindful not only of other, of other creatures, but that the gods themselves might not always know exactly what they're doing. It's easier to think of God as always having the right answers. In the Popol Vuh, those gods do not have the right answers. I think that that, that to me is a very important aspect that uh, really speaks to the, uh, uh, some people describe it as pagan, but I would say polydeistic, meaning that it has many gods, uh, almost in a, in a sense of idolatry that the, that the pre-Columbian cultures had. They did not believe in only one God. They, they believed in a plurality and they, they did not believe that our universe, our world is the best possible world. Ours is just one of several attempts. And uh, that's a little more humbling. Uh, yeah, uh, that, very much so. Well, we live in the best possible world and nothing competes with us. And I think in the age of Trump, uh, that is very much an attractive element. We are not the best. Yeah, agreed. Um, I think that's a definitely important message to, <laughs> to remember. And uh, I think that's a great, that, that's one of the a great uh, lesson or, or value to take away, I think, that hopefully can get passed down. Um, so I also want to think about, you know, we, we talked a little bit at the beginning about how we got the Popol Vuh as a book, you know, where it came from and the translations and, and all that. Um, and, and that, as you pointed out, the, the book is, is, you know, it's, it's trying to keep that. It's trying to keep those traditions. It's trying to keep that history. Um, so I found it interesting because, you know, the text calls out um, that, the bearded white man's intent on dismantling those traditions and must be resisted. And uh, so I was just curious, you know, was that, was that in the actual original story? Do we think it was added by Father uh, Jimenez, which maybe is a weird thing to add, you know, that they, that people didn't want like you, maybe he was trying to be honest or, or I guess, yeah. How can we think about, you know, at what point, the Kiche sort of realized what was happening and that it was important to preserve this information and, and, and how the story might have changed even because of that? It's a, it's a crucial question in that it invites us to think about how stories are born, how stories pass on, as we were mentioning, from one generation to the next, and how stories get enriched or maybe, you know, on some occasion diminished by the various interpreters or voices that uh, take upon themselves the responsibility of bringing out and about a, a new take. Uh, it's it's uh, maybe painful to recognize that the survival of the Kiche book um, that tells the story of how this aspect of the Mayan nation uh, was able to survive was uh, transcribed with the help and a agency of a Spaniard who himself was very much a, on the other side of the, of the divide. He, he was one of the oppressors, but he had switched sides. He was very interested in indigenous cultures and he wanted to preserve this as best as he could because he understood 
that the Spaniards that had arrived had uh, demolished the local, the local culture in that it was important to do something in terms of social justice in order mm -hmm. to preserve it. So he's a curator, he's a collector, he's a, 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 a he, he perseveres and he, he enables the text to, to continue. Um, he, it is also clear, John, that he must have had exactly what, but it's, it's a debate among scholars, some sort of influence of how the story was told. Yeah. He, he, he slightly appears at the end, but uh, I, am, I wanted to make the story come to the present. I wanted to contextualize it, so I inserted him even more than he had than his own role uh, in the f beginning and in the latter part of the book. And mm -hmm. I also wanted to push the story of the Popo Vuh beyond the moment of transcription in 701 to the present. Uh, and so those elements are part of the retelling of how the the continuity of the Kiche culture does not stop for, with the moment that it has, when it was first written in Spanish, only after being written in Spanish was it translated to its original language, Kiche. Mm. So the, the original, so to speak, is Spanish. But how many of us translators have added to the story? And every time we read the book, and every time we open it, we are part of those creators and, and they, we also encourage the 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 Kiche people to, to survive. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, a kind of really beautiful way to think about it. And and uh I definitely see that your your influence there in trying to meet those goals. Um yeah, and my sense is probably maybe you could speak to it, but I think that's probably what the coda was designed towards a little bit. It seemed to me that there were some maybe specific calls to action or things for the reader today to pay attention to and think about, you know, maybe talk about how, how that part of the book came together. Yes, I think that we are never passive readers. We are always active readers and there are not, the, the stories are never finished. Even when we finish a book, I don't think that the story ends there. It lives in our imagination. And sometimes when we retell a, a part of the story, a novel that we read, a short story, a poem to a friend or to a parent or to, or to a sibling, we embellish it, we add certain characters, we cut it, we shape it. I am interested in, in that type of how stories are collective. How we, mm. I love how people tell jokes if you hear a joke for the very first time, and then if you had this capacity to see how many times the joke is told, you see that it, everybody has added a little bit and it's kind of a broken telephone. When you yeah. come to the end of the life of the joke, it, it, has, it is not funny anymore. And there has, there, it has elements to it that have been added by everybody else. It kind of has the DNA of everybody that, was, that participated. And I think that we tend to see literature in a very kind of passive way. We open a book, we close it, and that's it. I think the life, I think the reader is as much a creator than the author, really as much. And I think, for instance, the, the, a book like Don Quixote is not only the book that Cervantes wrote, but it's the book that any and every one of us has read and has reimagined in, in her or his imagination. And I think of that when I think of translators and when I think of retellers, I love the idea of in, in the old tribes, the, the storyteller will always, would always tell a story in order to keep his people or her people engaged with the battle, with the idea of connecting with the lords and they and needed to find all sorts of strategies to, to create that sense. And I think we do that a lot as well, I wanted to have a little of that in my own retelling of the of the Popol Vuh. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, I, I want to wrap things up here. We covered just a huge amount of ground. Uh, the, you know, there's obviously so much more in the book, but you know, is there anything you feel like you really wanted to get across, or you want people to understand when they read the the book that maybe we didn't have a chance to talk about? Maybe the last thing that I would say. John, is that in, in, a, in a world like ours, where we are stimulated all the time 
with so many different types of storytelling. Uh, Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime, um, reading a book, uh, surfing the internet, uh, going on a podcast, uh, yeah. uh, going to school and listening to what the, the teacher is telling us. Uh, really, the very different types of stories that we tell each other are stories that keep us alive. I think that storytelling is as important as oxygen. Mm. It, take away the stories from our lives and we die, just as if you take away the oxygen and we die. And I think it's very important to genuinely try to see how ancient people have told stories and how those stories have managed to survive in one way or another to the present. Not only contemporary stories have value, but all stories have value too. And we connect to our ancestors through those past stories or to the ancestors of other people. So I invite your listeners to open this book and any other story of origins and imagine that, uh, that th this is a story of belonging. This is a story of how values pass on from the past to the future. And that we ourselves are always in the act and art of telling origin stories. Um, that, uh, that very human aspect will never disappear. Yeah, agreed. Here, here. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much for that. Let's do a little thunder round. We'll do a little getting to know you tradition that I have, and uh, we'll call it a day. All right. Pleasure. Okay. What is your favorite food and or drink? My favorite food are tacos. And my favorite drink is just plain, simple and pure water. Those are great answers. I also enjoy both and consume both uh, <laughs> quite a lot. Uh, next question, where is your favorite place you've ever been? My favorite place is wherever I find myself at this particular present. And right now it's in front of a computer looking at you via Zoom and talking about a subject that uh, I'm very interested in and uh, reacting to the wonderful questions you're asking. Okay. I like that, uh, the mirror image answer there. Uh, all right, last question. If you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and why? If I could wave a magic wand and change one thing, I would, um, I would allow myself to have one, to live one day in the life of William Shakespeare. I would- William Shakespeare? I would be William Shakespeare for one day. Wow. Any particular moment in his life? Uh, just as he is about to stage Hamlet uh, in, in uh, 1601, and or a little after that and he this his son hamnet who was a, he had three kids and uh, it was a daughter and two and, and a set of twins and hamnet died four years of the plague four years before he wrote hamlet mm -hmm. and it is at the moment i would like to be at the moment where um, Shakespeare is about to see the first staging of the play and he decides to play the role of the ghost, the father of Hamlet. Mm. Okay. I like that extremely specific answer. Well, I, I hope that, I hope that you get that wand. That would be an incredible experience. Uh, thank you. I really <laughs> like that. Just the invitation that you've made has, has made me imagine it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, again, the book is Popol Vu. Uh, you've got the retelling of this amazing Quiche origin story with some beautiful illustrations. Uh, Elon Stavans, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this was a great conversation. My pleasure. I appreciate what you do. Uh, keep the stories uh, alive through, po through podcasts. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. Mm -hmm.